Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with uh, convection heat transfer. Convection heat transfer consists out of quite a number of chapters. We had the first chapter just on the fundamentals, another chapter on external convection, and now we are busy with chapter 8 in the textbook of Sengel and Gujar on internal forced convection. And in that regard, we already uh, looked at uh, the average velocities and temperatures at any possible station, then the entry region for laminar flow and turbulent flow. We've seen how the heat transfer coefficient changes and uh, then specifically a very important section that we are busy with which is on laminar flow and that is then also specifically the cases of constant heat flux and constant wall temperature. We've spent almost two lectures on constant heat flux because it is so important. I'm just going to revise some of the most important things quickly and then we're going to do constant wall temperature in this lecture. So those are two very, very important cases and their behaviors are totally different. And it's very important because when you, when you will have to analyze a problem, uh, it's not going to work if you just use formulas. You need to really understand what is happening because when you do, it will make it possible for you to make the right decisions and also to do the correct calculations and to really understand the problem. Okay, so with a constant heat flux case, what we had there is the heat flux. Every millimeter, we put in the same number of watts, or every 10 millimeters, or every meter, or whatever. Okay. And if we look typically at how the flow will behave, then there will be a region where the flow will be developing. And we can calculate that by saying it is equal to 0.05 multiplied by Reynolds, multiplied uh, by uh, Prandtl, multiplied by the diameter. Okay. Then we can determine this length. Now in this developing region, the heat transfer coefficient is not a constant, but then after that it is fully developed and the heat transfer coefficient is a constant. In terms of the temperatures, in terms of the temperatures, okay, when we look at the inlet temperature, if we consider that for every millimeter we put in the same amount of heat, then it is very easy to derive or even you know, just to look, to think of your feelings or uh, uh, to, to look, to determine that that would be a straight line. Uh, we, we've derived it in any case, okay. So that is the fluid temperature, but the surface temperature is a little bit more complicated. We can determine it if we have the heat transfer coefficient, okay, because QS, um, let me write it here, the, the heat flux is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface temperature minus the mean temperature, this temperature here, or uh, let me not say fluid, let me rather call it Tm. Okay. It is the fluid by Tm. Okay. So if we have this temperature, and that, if that is constant and that is constant, okay, then it's easy to see that if this is also a constant like there, then we can get the surface temperature, and that delta T would be a constant, and we can determine it. But to get the surface temperature here, we need to know how the heat transfer coefficient varies with position. The important thing, however, is also to look at this distance here. Okay. So the distance, if, and that is the if, if the heat transfer coefficient is constant, okay, then that distance represents the heat flux. Now the constant wall temperature now be the case where again the inlet temperature is Ti and the outlet temperature Te. But now the surface temperature is maintained at a constant temperature Ts. Okay. And I've, uh, I've discussed it with you how you do that 
and that is very, very important application in mechanical engineering. Uh, a huge percentage, more than 50%, I think most probably 75% and even more of applications in industry will be where you have evaporation or condensation or boiling. Okay, and the result of that would be a constant wall temperature if the pressure drop is not very large. Okay. okay, so if we now look at typically how the temperature behaves, okay, through there and the heat transfer coefficient. Now the heat transfer coefficient, again, there's going to be a developing part and then it is going to be fully developed. And we do not know where this is. This might, might be negligible in terms of the length or it might be most of the length. We do not know. So that is just an arbitrary choice where I've drawn that. So that is fully developed. Okay. So if we now look at this case and we would like to look at the surface temperature and the fluid temperature, then for this case we can say, well, the surface temperature is remain constant, so that is equal to Ts. So if you have your red pen and blue pen, again use the red for the hot side and the blue for the cold side. Okay, so that's typically what is going to happen with the surface temperature. Now, here is the inlet temperature of the fluid. Okay, and we do not know at this stage how to get the outlet temperature. At this stage we do not know how to get the outlet temperature, but let's suppose it is known. Okay. And let's suppose that is the outlet temperature. Okay. Like that. Okay. And let's suppose in terms of previously what happened, we can say, well, let's assume again a straight line. Okay. And this temperature, so by the way, is called the bulk temperature. The bulk temperature is equal to the inlet temperature plus the outlet temperature divided by two. That value there. But think about it a little bit. If this wall temperature remains constant, and this is water, Maybe that temperature is 100 degrees Celsius, and now it's 20 here. The delta T here would be 80 degrees Celsius. Do you, do you agree? Okay. So there will be a certain amount of heat transfer. Okay. So the fluid temperature will increase as we go downstream. Now let's suppose the fluid temperature there is 50. Okay. Let's suppose it is 50, and the wall temperature is 100. So now the delta T is equal to 50. Okay, and here it was 80. So what happens with the heat transfer rate? The heat transfer rate becomes smaller and smaller as the fluid temperature increases. So if we go and measure the fluid temperature there on the inside, then it would actually do something like that. Okay. So that is the mean temperature of the fluid. So it is not a straight line. If the length is very short, of course, then it would be a reasonable assumption to say, well, you know, we can make a straight line assumption, but normally that would not be the case. So the temperature would do something like that. Now let's look at a control volume on the inside of the tube that we are considering. And let's suppose that is equal to dx, okay. and that area is equal to dAs, the surface area. Okay. That temperature, of course, is equal to Ts, okay, everywhere, it's a constant. And let's look at the heat transfer rate to the control volume. So there's the control volume. <coughs> there will be the heat transfer rate going into the control volume. That would be the heat transfer rate going out of the control volume. 
and that would be delta Q, the heat transfer rate, from the wall into the control volume. And in general, what we can do is we can say the heat transfer rate in would be equal to the mass flow rate multiplied by Cp multiplied by the temperature M, the mean temperature of the fluid. The heat transfer rate out be equal to the mass flow rate Cp multiplied by Tm plus the increase in temperature DTm. How much the temperature increases, that is the heat transfer rate out. And then here on the wall, we can say it is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by, uh, let me put, put in the area here, the surface area AS, okay, multiplied by TS minus TM, the heat transfer rate from the surface. Now if we go and do a little bit of manipulation, and you can go and do it at home, but it's very, very simple. But what you can do is you can show that DTM is equal to uh, minus D, TS minus TM. Okay. Where does this come from? Well, the fact that that is a constant, it's just a constant. Okay. And the surface area, the surface area is equal to the perimeter multiplied by dx. The surface area is the perimeter multiplied by dx. So if we look at this tube, maybe that is how it looks like. That is P and it is just the perimeter, the weighted perimeter. Okay. Okay, so if we do a little bit of substitution in here and we clean it up and we rewrite it then we can actually show it is equal to D Ts minus Tm divided by Ts minus Tm is equal to minus Hp multiplied by the mass flow rate Cp dx. And obviously this thing asks to be integrated, as you can see, okay? So this thing wants to be integrated, but before we do that, and this is now one of the most important parts to realize when you look at this specific case. If we want to do the integration, we would obviously like to say that is equal to a constant. <laughs> you agree? Okay. Well, is it a constant? The heat transfer coefficient, do something like that. So it is not a constant, okay. but uh, depending on the problem, if it is a problem where most of the flow is fully developed in any case, then the heat transfer coefficient would mostly be constant right through the tube. Then it would be a very good assumption to say that is equal to a constant. If it is only fully developed here, then it would not be a good assumption. So taking that into consideration, there's also a third approach, and that is to say, well, uh, you know, uh, that might be so, but, you know, let me choose. That is sort of the constant of the transfer coefficient. You agree? A good engineering approach. Okay. So then we can say, well, that is now a constant. Put question marks there so that you realize that is not always the case. <laughs> Okay, and then all that would be a constant. And even there we have to be careful because Cp is a little bit a function of temperature. So it will depend on application. Okay. But what we normally do, we also going to assume Cp is a constant. And we, when we do that, then we can now say, well, 
let's do the integration of uh, d uh, ts minus tm divided by ts minus tm is equal to minus hp multiplied by the mass flow rate cp and if we do the integration now then when x is equal to zero that temperature is equal to the inlet temperature ti okay. when x is equal to l then that temperature is equal to the outlet temperature okay. and as I've mentioned, we assume that is a constant, but all the time in the back of your head you must remember, be careful, it's not a constant. Okay. And then we can do the integration, and if we clean it up, then we get the limb of Ts minus Te divided by Ts minus Tm, uh, is equal to minus the transfer coefficient uh, if we do the L coming in again then we get again the area divided by the mass flow rate CP okay. let's call that equation one because we're going to use it a little bit later and maybe what we should even do is put that thing there to indicate it is an assumption for a constant heat transfer coefficient or then at least the average heat transfer coefficient. Mm, I think I might make made a mess here. Yeah, I think that must be a TM, something like that. Okay. Right. So if we get rid of the Lin term and we clean it up, if I've made an error here or two, just go and redo it about the principle and all the details in the textbook, then we can show that the outlet temperature is equal to Ts minus Ts minus Ti e to the minus h surface area divided by the mass flow rate Cp and let's call that equation 2. Yep. Yes, minus Tm, wouldn't that give you limb 1, which is 0? Um, yeah, somewhere I've made an error here, just go and check um, what I did. Okay, da, da. Um, I think... Uh, da, da, da. No, no, this is right. D, okay, the question was, uh, if this is not 1, obviously it is not 1, you should look at, at, at this like dx. Okay. This is uh, something that you need to do the integration with. It's fine. Okay, wait a minute, just a minute. Um, all the detail is in the textbook. After the lecture, I can come back to that if it's about the mathematics. I, I do not want to get into the mathematics now because I have quite a lot of work to do. But let's, after the lecture, we can just go quickly through it, okay? So, I've made an error here in the writing, it doesn't matter. Okay, so just look at the, at the result at the moment, okay? Okay. So, in the mathematics, what I'm trying to do is in the mathematics to show you the transfer coefficient and that you really understand what is going on here and where it comes from, okay? Okay, so this is now the equation of how, of the outlet temperature. But at the same time, if we would now redo this problem, not over the length L, okay. 
So if we go and do the integration from 0 to x, okay, where x is now any distance in the tube, then we can write this equation as mm, the mean temperature as a function of x is equal to the surface temperature minus Ts minus Ti e to the minus h uh, multiplied by p and then x okay, divided by the mass flow rate and Cp. I do not think this equation is like that in your textbook. Okay. So many students would only use this equation and then they will use it to get the outlet temperature, okay, this temperature here. But in many cases you need to get the temperature at other positions also. So it is very simple then to adjust the equation so that you can get the equation everywhere. So again, look at it, there's an E term in it. Okay. And that tells you that the behavior is like that and not a linear line for the surface temperature. Okay. Now, so this, the temperature between the surface and the fluid decays exponentially. So that is what this equation tells us, very importantly. Now, a very important constant that we're going to introduce now is the NTUs, the number of transfer units. NTUs, number of transfer units. And the NTUs is exactly equal to this equation, the transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area divided by the mass flow rate and the Cp. And that is an indication of the effectiveness of a heat exchanger. Okay. So this is the number of transfer units and it is an indication of the effectiveness of a heat exchanger. But it doesn't mean that we have to try to get that number as large as possible. Because if you look at it, I mean, you can always increase it, isn't it? I mean, if you increase the area, the NTUs is going to increase. If you increase the heat transfer coefficient, that, can you, that you can do by using uh, enhanced surfaces or wires on the inside or spiral plates, you can do that. The mass flow rate, just put, put through more flow and the CP depending on if you're limited to maybe water then you cannot really do much about it but that can always be increased okay so if I ask any of you now you know uh, design a heat exchanger for me and try to get the NTUs to be high because that's an indication of the effectiveness then one of you will choose maybe 10 and another one 20 another one 50 and another 100 or a thousand you, you agree but let's look at it very, very carefully. And we're going to do it with a sort of a problem. And the problem is going to be the case where the temperature, the surface temperature is equal to 100. 100 degrees Celsius surface temperature. And the inlet temperature is 20. inner temperature is 20. Now that is the length of the tube, okay, L, and we can now calculate the NTUs based on that length because the NTUs is equal to the average heat transfer coefficient multiplied by its surface area and the surface area is equal to P multiplied by L, you agree? Divided by the mass flow rate and the Cp. Okay. Okay. And let's look at that point here, halfway through. What would the NTUs be at that point there? The NTUs would be equal to if the heat, heat transfer coefficient is a constant and P is a constant, then its L will be L divided by 2. That would still be the same and that would be the same. You see? Okay. So let's be, let, before we put it there, let's just write out. 
the NTUs at L divided by 2 is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by P multiplied by L divided by 2 divided by the mass flow rate and the CP. Okay. okay. So it means the NTUs at L divided by 2 is equal to the NTUs at L divided by 2. Okay. And the same for a quarter and three quarters and right through it. Okay. Now let's suppose <coughs> let's suppose for this problem that the NTUs is equal to 5. The NTUs is equal to 5. Again, it would mean it is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by PL divided by the mass flow rate and the CP. Okay. Okay, so if the NTUs is equal to 5 there, okay, it is equal to 2.5 at that position there. And in the quarter, it would be 1, and there it would be equal to 3. Mm, oh, sorry, uh, 1.25, and what is it? Uh, 2.5 plus 5 divided by 2. Okay, something like that. Okay. So the NTUs is directly proportional to the length. Okay. Now let's suppose we would now for this case now where we want to get the outlet temperature or the temperature as a function of x. Set it is equal to the surface temperature minus the surface temperature minus the inlet temperature e to the minus NTUs. Okay, now the surface temperature is 100 minus, again, the surface temperature which is 100 minus the inner temperature which is 20. Okay, E to the minus NTUs. So depending on the value of the NTU, we can actually calculate all the temperatures now. You agree? Now, before we do that, I just want to give you typical values of NTUs for the outlet temperature TE. Okay. Okay, so the, if the NTUs is equal to 0.01, okay. so if that is equal to 0.01, then the outlet temperature would be 20.8. And the outlet temperature would be 20.8. So just come back, back to this problem. Surface temperature 100, inlet temperature 20. The NTUs is equal to 0.01. So the outlet temperature on this scale is going to be there. Okay. I hope you will agree with me that you will say, but this is not going to be an effective heat exchanger. Almost nothing happens. Okay. Temperature it just increases with 0.8 degrees Celsius. Okay. So Let's just go, let's go and increase it to 0.5. Then it is equal to 51.48. If it is equal to 1, then it is equal to 70.6. Okay, so now, with inner temperature of 20, it increased now to 70.6, so a 50 degree delta T for the fluid. Let's increase it to 2.5. Now it is equal to 93.43. Now, now we're in business. Okay. Okay. Of course, inner temperature was 20 and the outlet temperature is now 93. So that's quite reasonable. Okay. So if that is so simple, let's just keep on increasing the NTUs. Okay. So let's increase it to 3. Then it is equal to 96.02. So that's great. <laughs> okay. 
What are we waiting for? Let's increase it even more to 5. If we increase it to 5, it is 99.46. Okay. 99.46. And if it is 10, it is going to be 100. So then, that fluid temperature would be the same as the surface temperature. Okay. So, <clears throat> if you look at this now, and you must make a decision on the NTUs. What NTU will you choose for this case? What will you choose? 2.5. What would you choose? Anybody else? Anybody for 10? 5? Okay. okay. Now it usually happens, or usually it really makes sense to draw something out like this so that we can have a better idea. So that same case of the surface temperature is 100, okay. and the inlet temperature is 20. the temperature 20. Okay, if that is equal to L, okay. and if the NTUs is equal to 5, then that temperature there would be equal to 99.46. And that surface temperature there would be equal to 100. You see? Okay. And when it is 2.5, Okay, okay 2.5, then it would be equal to 93. So 93 is about there, 93. And uh, if it is equal to 1, uh, then it would be about uh, 70 there. Okay. So you will see that the profile of the temperature as a function of x, okay, and then if we use our colors to indicate that is the hot side there, then the temperatures would do okay, something like that for an NTU of 5. Okay. And you decide that you would like to have it 2.5. Okay. If you would like to have it 2.5, then that outlet temperature would be 93. That would be there. Okay which I think would be a very sensible decision. Okay. If you would keep on increasing the NTUs, what happens? We can see that the temperature difference becomes smaller and smaller. Okay. So if you would actually now decide, well, I want to increase the NTUs to 10, how can you do it? Very easily by just the NTUs is equal to... Uh, ta -da -da. Mm. Uh, there it is, it's directly proportional to the surface. So just by increasing the length, we can actually uh, uh, get to NTU of 10, okay, NTU of 10, and then those two would be at the same temperature. So if I could draw it like that, typically uh, that is going to happen. Okay. Right. Why would this not be a good selection for a heat exchanger? Because it's going to be very expensive. Okay. Because you will have to double the length just to increase the outlet temperature with about 0.5 degrees Celsius. And as I've said in the beginning, this, the temperature difference between those two lines indicate the heat flux. So heat flux is not a vector, but if we would now go and look at the heat transfer rates. Okay, the heat transfer rate. Okay. The heat transfer rate, okay, which is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface temperature minus Tm. Okay. We see that this temperature difference is very large here. And then it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay. So, as a general rule, if you see an NTU of 5, it's not a good selection. Uh, I myself would prefer two and a half to three. So from there on, I think you know you have to be 
very, very careful in terms of your decision. Most probably, you're not going to have a very effective heat exchanger. Okay. While you look at that, let me just clean the board on this side. Okay, any questions? Ladies and gentlemen, nothing. Okay, I'm a little bit pressed for time today, so that is why I, I want to be in a hurry. Uh, what we previously did, although maybe I did something wrong, uh, I think, uh, yeah, uh, TE, uh, okay, does it matter? But in any case, previously we looked at this equation of Lin, TS minus TE divided by TS minus TI, is equal to minus the transfer coefficient multiplied by the area divided by the mass flow rate and the CP. Okay. Now what we can do is we can write it as a function of mass flow rate CP is then equal to minus the heat transfer coefficient divided by the limb of TS minus TE uh, divided by TS minus TE, okay, like that. Okay, so all we did is we've solved the mass flow rate divided by CP. Okay. But from the equation, the transfer rate is equal to the mass flow rate CP multiplied by the outlet temperature minus the inlet temperature. In this case, the profile doesn't matter. It is just the difference between inlet and outlet, mass flow rate and CP. And what we now do is we take that and we substitute it into that equation. Okay. And the result is that we can now write that the heat transfer rate is equal to minus the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area, outlet temperature minus inlet, divided by the lin of okay, Ts minus Te divided by Ts minus Ti. And that is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area. And now we're introducing something new, which is called the LMTD the lock mean temperature difference, the LMTD. Okay. Now again, if we look at these graphs of TS and TI and TE, okay, ladies and gentlemen, please can you quiet down? If we look at this delta T here at the inlet, then that would be equal to delta T I, the delta T at the inlet, and that is equal to delta T at the outlet. Okay, and that is T S, and that is equal to T S. So delta T at the inlet is T S minus T I, delta T at the outlet is T S minus T E. And this distance here is called the outlet temperature minus the inlet temperature. You agree? Okay. And what we then can do is we can say that Te minus Ti is equal to, that temperature difference is equal to okay. delta Ti minus delta Te. You agree? And delta Ti is equal to Ts minus Ti. That temperature difference there, okay. minus here at the outlet, Ts minus Te. Okay. 
or just write it around ti minus te then equal to ts minus te minus ts minus ti okay why do i do that okay because i want to do substitutions here in terms of equations in the same order And the result of that is, if we write it out neatly, is that we can show that the LMTD, okay, the LMTD is equal to TS minus uh, TI minus TS minus TE divided by the limb of TS minus TI divided by Ts minus Te. Very, very important equation. Okay, it looks very confusing, okay. but don't let it be. It is actually very simple and I'm going to show you just now. Okay. Sometimes we can get lost by all the mathematics, but in principle what we have is that with the LMTD, if we have that, then that is equal to delta T inlet, that is delta T outlet. Okay. Then the LMTD is equal to the limb Oh, sorry, is equal to this temperature difference, delta Ti, minus this temperature difference, delta Te, divided by the limb of those two terms. The equation is quite robust. You can also do it from the other way around. You'll get the same answer. But always, ladies and gentlemen, be careful. Uh, let's suppose we have a case where the surface temperature is 100, the inlet temperature is 40, and the outlet temperature is 80. Okay. And we can go and calculate the LMTD, which is 71.1 degrees Celsius. So there's the stream and there's the surface temperature, just by doing the calculations. Do you agree? No. <laughs> no, it's wrong. Okay. Why is it wrong? Okay. If you just look at the values, here we've got 60 delta T, okay, and here we've got 20. Where will you expect should the temperature difference be, the LMTD? somewhere between 60 and 20. Okay. It can't be more than 60. Okay. So it's very easy to make calculation errors during tests and exams and in industry. Always ask yourself, does it make sense? Okay. Because we are calculating things which should be very physical in terms of our expectations. So there we've got a 60 delta T, there we've got 20, I would expect the LMTD, LMTD to be between those two values. Okay. Or let's look at the case where we now do cooling. Okay. The surface temperature is 0, 0, and now it's 20 and 10, and you would go and calculate the LMTD as 0.1. Okay. Again, it sort of doesn't make sense, isn't it? There we've got 20, there's 10, you know, I would expect it to be in between. Okay. Why? Because the LMTD, this is very, very important, is that in the beginning, remember, we've looked at this line here, which we say we do not have. That's the inlet temperature and that is the outlet temperature. Okay. And that is the bulk temperature. Okay. That is the bulk temperature there. Okay. 
so many engineers would look at an application like this and they would say, all right, that's the bulk temperature, that is TS, okay, that's TS. So what I'm going to do is I use that as my average temperature difference, T average, to that temperature there, okay. which is wrong for a constant wall temperature case. That is what this has been developed for, the LMTD. The LMTD is a more accurate representation of the temperature difference. It is not the temperature there and that. Okay. So that is not equal to the LMTD. Okay. The LMTD is, an in, in, is, is a temperature dis, the, a difference that has been taken into consideration by after integrating the temperature profile. Okay. An example is really going to show that very well, but we're running out of time, so with the next lecture we can continue with that. The student at the back that, uh, that I need to explain this to, if you can just come forward, then we can take a look at it. Okay.